Lisa. You like treats? What up everyone, it's Kirtan Singh here and I'm back with a brand new video. Today marks the one year anniversary since the release of Solo A Star Wars Story. So I thought, why not review it? So I've seen this film several times already. I saw it in the theater. I was one of the few people that did. And I also saw it last night. So I took a few notes on my phone and I'm basically gonna be running through these notes and then talking about what I liked and what I didn't like about the film. So let's talk about a few general things first before I really get into the film itself. So I said I saw this movie in the theaters. I saw it with my sister and when we went on opening day there were only seven people in the theater. That's how few people went to go watch this movie. And I'm pretty sure in an article I saw recently, Star Wars, Solo A Star Wars Story, is the seventh most expensive film ever made. And considering it made very few like of its like production money back that's not a good sign at all the film also has a really dark tone in regards to its cinematography and that's kind of annoying because sometimes it's very hard and dark to see certain scenes but i also really love the style that the cinematographer went for because there are some shorts which are beautiful and there's a real stylistic tone to it which some of the other star wars films don't really have the thing about this film is that it feels more like a checklist of the writers wanting to accomplish and just get to certain points in Han's life rather than them thinking of a story and then creating the film around that story or idea. They have Han do the Kessel Run which I found somewhat interesting for the first half and then I was kind of disappointed. I also had the headcanon that Han was doing a smuggler's run and then he, or a race of some sort, and then he took black holes and whatnot to do the race in a shorter period of um, distance. And that's why it was a really big thing. Because the Kessel Run, you know, it's not a, no one was trying to do the Kessel Run in less than 12, 12 20 parsecs or whatever. According to the film, it doesn't seem like something people would openly try and do. So the fact that Han's boasting about it doesn't really seem as big as an accomplishment because no one was really trying to do it. Nonetheless, the film also checks off Han getting his blaster, Han meeting Chewie, Han meeting Lando, Han um, getting the Falcon, um, Han and his dice, and really Han meeting Jabba technically, Han getting the smuggler's life, him being an Imperial pilot. It's just a whole lot of things just crammed into one movie and it just doesn't really gel well because it doesn't come off as competent writing. Going back to the start of the film, that's probably my favorite scene. I really love how the film opens. I love how it sets up the world. There's a little exposition which is kind of heavy, but it works, it's needed and it's necessary, so I don't mind. And I just love that opening chase scene and everything. It's funny, it's enjoyable. I do think that Han keeps on showing the dice way too often because it doesn't mean anything. It's not used in any other movie. The Last Jedi has Luke give it to Leia, but what the hell does that mean except for a representation of Han? And in this movie, Han keeps on giving the dice to Kira, his former lover. So it's, it's a real prick move for Luke to give that to Leia. Otherwise, I love this opening. I love the thermal detonator joke. I love how Lady Proxima is like this weird slug thingy. It looks cool. It kind of doesn't make sense why she would have uh, her greeting area directly next to a place which is night next to sunlight or whatever. It doesn't really make much sense. And I have no problem with this slug being the boss in this crime syndicate because, to be honest, if you question why this creature that can't go out in the sun is a boss, in this crime syndicate then you probably should be questioning why Jabba and the Huts are like in power considering they're slow as hell and they can't do much physically in themselves so I have no problem with her being here I think Jabba is a little more realistic um, because he is a little more imposing and he can actually go out in the daylight but nonetheless I don't have a problem with this opening scene that much and it's probably my favorite scene in the movie. We get introduced to Kira, who is a fine character, nothing wrong with her. I'm not one of the people that thinks um, Emilia Clarke can't act. I think it's more so that her characters are, aren't the best written characters. To get introduced to Rio, 
who is probably my favorite character out of like the whole smuggling group because he's fun, he's voiced by John Favreau, he looks pretty cool, he's just an enjoyable character except that he dies so easily along with Val, I think her name is. Yeah, whoever Beckett's love interest is, she dies way too easily, I don't care for her at all. Even when Beckett mourns for her, he gets over her like that. Beckett's a pretty cool character, you know, he does some cool things. I love the joke he makes with the thumbs and whatnot when they hurt on the Millennium Falcon during the um, Kessel Run. Um, but he does the whole spinning of the gun thing way too often for my liking and, you know, it gets a bit too much after a while. Lando is the next main character I'm going to talk about now. Everyone was really hyped, including myself, for Donald Glover to play Lando Calrissian because he just seemed like the perfect fit for Lando. And, you know, he is. He's really good as a young Lando, except you can tell that he's trying way too hard to actually be Billy D. Williams. Unlike Alden Ehrenreich, who plays Han Solo so well, Alden isn't trying to be Harrison Ford. He's making Han Solo his own, and that makes Han Solo more enjoyable to see, and I really love Alden as Han Solo. With Lando comes L3, who's one of the worst characters in Star Wars. I say that because they come off as a real prick. They're really forced in there with all this progressive um, droid rights and everything. And I don't have a problem if droid rights is a thing in Star Wars. But I don't think it really comes off well in this movie. I can't stand L3. And then along with that you have the whole pansexual relationship with her and Lando. And I have no problem with Lando being pansexual because... You're in space, there's a Star Wars galaxy, surely there are alien species out there where they don't have any genders in their race. Like the Asari in the Mass Effect series, they don't have any genders, they have female qualities in that, yeah sure, but they're not any gender specific species. So, look, my shepherd romanced um, Liara, so then why would I have a problem with Lando being pansexual? In that sense, the only problem I have is that he's attracted to a robot and he's in love with her and the movie plays that off as a joke but then it's actually something serious and it's actually true and you know I can get being you know attracted to aliens that aren't you know having a specific agenda and whatnot but a robot is a bit too far in this Star Wars series especially with Lando and I get you know in this real world we have people who fall in love with robots and whatnot that's weird in our world still, you know? Like, do whatever you want. It's, I can think it's weird. There's nothing wrong with that. And I can think it's weird in the Star Wars universe as well. So this movie has a lot of other minor problems. Like, you have the Wookiees on Kessel that don't look like Wookiees at all. They look like weird Yetis. And if you use the argument, oh, they're of a different subspecies or they're, you know, younger Wookiees or something. In the Clone Wars animated series, we saw a child Wookiee and he looked like a small version of Chewbacca. In um, episode 3 of Revenge of the Sith, we saw the Battle of Kashyyyk and we saw the Chewies and they just looked like different versions of mostly the same as Chewbacca. And along with that, I don't really like Infest Nest. I think they look cool with the arm and everything, but then when you take off the mask and you see a young teenager, early teenager girl, it just makes you question the fact that she's the leader of a Marauder group and the fact that she's been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Beckett on several occasions. Finally, let's talk about the ending scene itself. The whole infest nest thing and the trading of the coaxium, you know, it was fine. It wasn't a huge reveal, it wasn't something groundbreaking, but it was entertaining to at least, I should say. Um, Han shot first, which is a nice throwback to the original New Hope. I have no problem with Han shooting first or second. To me, it doesn't really matter because it's one small thing that doesn't take away too much from the character itself, in my opinion. But... It was a good ending to this movie and I like how Kira leaves Han instead of going with Han. It opens up this huge dynamic and possibilities for a sequel. But the problem lies with Darth Maul. Now I loved Darth Maul's reveal when I saw this movie in cinemas. I thought it was great, I thought it was really interesting and it really showed some sort of connectivity between this movie and the rest of Star Wars. But there's a huge problem that they dug themselves into and that was the average viewer doesn't know Darth Maul was alive. I had a friend message me after watching Solo um, and they were like, oh let me guess this movie takes place before The Phantom Menace. And I was just thinking, that's not possible. How, why do people think that? Han Solo is in A New Hope and there's a good 30 years between Phantom Menace and A New Hope. No way Han Solo is, you know, taking on Darth Maul before the events of A New Hope. No way that the Emperor Empires around, stormtroopers are around, 
before the events of um, The Phantom Menace, sorry, I said A New Hope earlier, I meant The Phantom Menace. And, you know, there was another group of friends who I watched the movie with, um, and they were like, how is Darth Maul alive, it doesn't make sense. And, you know, I was excited when I saw it, but then, because they don't really explain it in the movies, or they don't have any, you know, sort of insight into how he survived, they show his robot legs and that, sure, but they should have, like, some sort of scene explaining it at least, so that way, you know, it might take away from the film, but at least audiences will understand what's going on. The other problem I had with it was the fact that Darth Maul wasn't planned to be the overall boss from the start. At first they were thinking, oh yeah, just some random bad guy. Sometimes they were thinking of Darth Vader, and they eventually landed on Darth Maul. And it kind of just feels like they put Darth Maul there just for shock value, just for the sake of it. Especially when you find out that they were going to give Darth Maul his original double-bladed lightsaber. And it wasn't until the voice actor and stuff was like, no, he would have this lightsaber and this thing and that thing. And it just goes to show that, well, the writers and the director, Ron Howard, obviously didn't really know enough about Star Wars to have planned this out properly. So while I still think a sequel would be really good, the fact that Han doesn't believe in the Force until the events of A New Hope means that he can't go face to face with Darth Maul. Darth Maul is somehow going to get from where he is now to the events in Star Wars Rebels. And there's also the explanation of how um, the Clone Wars, him on Mandalore, leads to him running a syndicate still in the events of Solo, there's a whole lot of gaps to fill and a whole lot of story to put inside and for now we're just questioning whether or not this can all actually work. So that's all I'm going to talk about for the movie itself. Now I'm actually going to just mention something. It's funny how this movie, as I said earlier, cost one of, like, one of the most expensive films of all time and they had the new director Ron Howard come in um, after Lord and Miller were fired, the people who made Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. They were fired from Solo, A Star Wars Story, which is really shit because I was really looking forward to the movie they were going to make. And I think it would have been much better than the one we got. But the thing is, they were fired and then on the day that Ron Howard came into set to start filming again, Disney Lucasfilm got George Lucas to come to set as well to see what was going on. And it's just funny how when Disney Lucasfilm think they're doing fine, think that they don't need George Lucas, they don't have him. But then the moment they screw up, they bring George Lucas on board to come and help. And they were making this big hoo-ha about the fact that he directed a scene in Solo, A Star Wars Story. Kathleen Kennedy was like, you know, I think fans will really enjoy what he does. The scene that he directed was that he was like, you know, Han wouldn't hang Lando's cape on the hanger. He'd probably just chuck it to the side before he kisses Kira. And I'm like, is that the only difference that George Lucas made? Is that you bring him on after you screw up a whole movie. They made like 90% of the movie before they filmed it again. And then that's the only direction you take from it. They really show how poorly they handled this movie and possibly the whole Star Wars franchise with this one event. I'm going to end this review here. Maybe a little long, I don't know. But Solo A Star Wars Story was a pretty decent film. It's not great, it's not terrible. It's definitely better than The Last Jedi. Sadly, the writing lets it down a lot because it feels more like a checklist than an actual story that wanted to be told. The acting is great for the most part. The only problem I have with the characters include Val, some of Beckett, and L3. Everyone else I think is fine. Dryden Voss is a fine villain. He's not terrible, he's not amazing, but he's a villain that we needed for the story. The Darth Maul reveal is alright at best. With that all said, I would give this movie a 6.8 out of 10. And I'll catch y'all next time.